You want a war? You're gonna get one. Breathe and stop the rim. Give it what you got. Just uh. Breathe and stop the rim. Give it what you got. Just uh. Breathe and stop the rim. Give it what you got. Give it on the block. Keep making that high. Give it on the block. Keep making that high. Give it on the block. Keep making that high. Welcome to a special episode of Reliving the War. It's the 7th of January, 99. We're in Richmond, Virginia, and today we're looking at the episode of Thunder that took place after the infamous finger poke of doom. Why is this being covered in its own video? Well, on next week's WCW Nitro, this particular Thunder episode gets mentioned a lot, and rather than cutting back and forth between Nitro and Thunder, I thought it would be best to look at everything that happens in a bit more detail, while hopefully adding more context to what we see next week. Also, this episode of Thunder lays the groundwork for the NWO Elite. We learn who's in, we learn who's out, and we'll hear what Hogan and Nash have to say following their historic match earlier in the week. We'll also look at every match on the show because, well, why not? We might as well take a look at the match bookings too for those who aren't familiar with WCW's Thursday Night Television show. Like most episodes of Thunder, this one opens up with a recap of what happened on Nitro. This time though, the whole finger poke of Doom saga gets laid out along with the Bishop vs Flair rivalry from start to end. Usually I'd call this a waste of time, but things have gotten a tad bit confusing recently on WCW television, so this recap was actually pretty useful for viewers who haven't been watching over these past few weeks. We see what happened when Nitro went off the air, a spray painted Goldberg called out Kevin Nash to the ring for a fight, but instead he got the Atlanta Falcons. Billy Boy continued to call Nash out, he said the whole NWO could come out if they wanted to, but Nash and company were too busy laughing their asses off backstage and in the end there was no NWO vs Falcons brawl in the Georgia Dome. Mike Tanay said he felt sick to his stomach after what happened last week. Tony Schiavone calls Hogan vs Nash the worst incident in professional wrestling history, and Bobby Heenan says throughout his entire career in professional wrestling, he's never witnessed anything as disgusting as what went down at the end of Nitro this past Monday. Mean Gene Okerlund welcomes WCW President Ric Flair to the ring, and Flair says the Richmond Coliseum reeks of tradition. Everyone's here tonight because of tradition. Flair wrestled Harley Race in this venue back in 81, and the match featured two men fighting until one man quit or got pinned. They fought to be the World Heavyweight Champion. Hulk Hogan thinks that Ric Flair was and still is one step behind him in terms of the pecking order, Kevin Nash thinks Flair's an old man who can't go anymore, but both Hogan and Nash are not going to have to live with what they did on Nitro. Ten years from now they'll always remember the incident in the Georgia Dome. They scammed everyone and Nash is going to have to look at his kid and say I lay down. Nature Boy gets very animated here by the way and so does Mean Gene. Rick can't believe that Nash would go along with this and Rick blames himself for booking the match in the first place. Nate also says that Lex Luger sucks for deceiving Goldberg and the fans. And as for Eric Bischoff, Eric's being summoned to Flair's office in Atlanta at 8am tomorrow morning. Harvey Schiller, Ted Turner and Ric Flair are going to work out what to do with Hogan and Nash. And Flair says the NWO are going to pay the price for once again destroying the traditions of WCW. We'll come back to the NWO in just a moment, but first we've got Ernest Miller vs Perry Saturn in a Starcade rematch. Check it out, our main man Sonny Ono's been playing WCW Thunder on PlayStation. He gave it a 5 out of 5 in his video review and he said it's super easy to control and the animations are as smooth as butter. Miller does not give Saturn the usual 5 seconds to walk away from the match, instead he throws a few kicks and Saturn just isn't intimidated at all. Perry should have taken his opponent more seriously though because the kick gets the early advantage with a throat thrust. But not to worry, it doesn't take long for Saturn to fight back and Ernie Miller takes a good old fashioned kick in the corner. Miller replies with a standing sidekick and after choking Saturn on the mat he hits another. Perry then tries a sunset flip but he ends up getting karate chopped instead. Miller begins showboating though and this leads to Perry eventually covering his opponent but he only gets a 2. Standing sidekick number 3 ladies and gents and this pissed Saturn off so much that he ends up putting Miller down with a head and arm suplex. 
Sonny Ono then gets punched in the face for standing on the apron and the cat fails to capitalize on this little distraction. Perry pulls off an exploder suplex, he follows this up with a falcon arrow, he goes for a pin and Chris Jericho shows up to pull the referee out of the ring. Scott Dickinson then runs into the ring and Saturn falls victim to a fast count. This was impossible to see during the match itself and you only really get to see what happened during a replay, but the ongoing blood feud between Scott Dickinson and Perry Saturn continues on in WCW. Must see television, ladies and gents. We see members of NWO Black and White standing backstage. Giant, Kurt Hennig, Brian Adams, Vincent, Horace and Scott Norton. They don't look too happy either, so something's up. A limousine pulls up and we've got guys wearing red and black shirts inside. Hulk Hogan, Lex Luger, Scott Hall, Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell. Conan is nowhere to be found. Hogan's also completely changed the way he dresses and I'm eager for his new hip hop album to drop sometime this year. Giant wants to know what's going on and Hogan says there's definitely a lack of communication at the moment, but Hogan's gonna get together with all the NWO members in just a moment. In the meantime, he wants Giant to look after some sort of Coca-Cola deal the NWO have going on and he also wants the Giant to watch his back in case Goldberg shows up. Apparently, there are no issues within the NWO and there's no split, but the Giant still seems pissed off that certain NWO members have been left in the dark. The group again walking backstage and they head into a dressing room, so it would appear that the NWO are united but they aren't at the same time. It seems like we maybe have a hand selected NWO, that being the Wolfpack, and we have a bunch of rejects who weren't in on the whole finger poke of doom fiasco. Bonus reliving the war cruiserweight action? Yeah, I'll take it. We've got Billy Kidman defending the cruiserweight title against Psychosis. Kidman takes Psychosis down at the opening bell with a big snap mare and this gets followed up with a dropkick that sends Psychosis out of the ring. A plancha then wipes Psychosis out just before a commercial break and when we come back we see both men are laid out on the floor. Mike Tanay explains that this is the result of Kidman taking a back sent on. Back in the ring the challenger goes down following a clothesline and a BK bomb. He does manage to counter a suplex but he then makes the often repeated mistake of trying to power bomb Billy Kidman. Psychosis gets planted, Kidman looks for the shooting star press, but Juventud Guerrero makes an appearance and the champ decides to take this little twerp out. Juventud gets his ass kicked and Kidman then tries to fight off both members of the LWO. When things go south, Rey Mysterio shows up to even the odds and Rey's crossbody here looks great. The red and black NWO then show up and the cruiserweights now have a big problem. Juve escapes, Kidman gets whacked by Scott Steiner and Psychosis takes a jackknife powerbomb from Kevin Nash. Rey Mysterio gets spared by Big Sexy, Nash tells Rey to leave the ring and Mysterio really has no choice, and once Rey leaves, Big Kev rips the LWO shirt off Psychosis' back. Clearly, the LWO can't exist if the New World Order is back in full force. Nash grabs a mic, he says Wolfpack in the house, and he then says the Hogan that he can't believe Ric Flair would say such things about the classic match he and Hulk put on in the Georgia Dome. Hogan says Flair just can't accept the fact that Kevin Nash gave the Hulkster the toughest challenge of his entire career. Hulk calls Flair a has-been, yeah he called him a has-been, and has-been Flair can't accept the fact that Nash and Hogan set a new standard in the land of traditional wrestling. Guys remember, Hulk Hogan isn't a has-been, I mean look at the way he's dressed, are those the kind of threads a has-been would wear? I think not my friends. Hogan then says the NWO are taking everything back, it started with the world championship but the NWO takeover has only begun. Hulk says with the help of, and I quote, Flexi Lexi, Buffy Wuffy, Big Scott and Big Papa Pump, the Wolfpack's taking over everything. Fucking Buffy Wuffy. Apparently Kevin Nash has made a call to the brothers who support the NWO and on Nitro the Wolfpack are going to show what backup's all about. This prompts the NWO black and white rejects to come down to the ring and again the giant looks pissed off. The giant gets in the ring, he completely ignores Kevin Nash. He says Hogan didn't speak to him like he said he was gonna do and the giant thinks Hogan must be hiding something. Hogan says the red and black were watching the monitors, they saw the LWO shirt on TV and they made their move. The giant's reading into this too much and the big man needs to chill out. Giant's not buying it, so Hogan changes his tune and now the giant's a problem. 
Hug says he loves these guys wearing black and white shirts, but the giant screwed up when he let Macho Man Randy Savage attack him on Nitro two weeks ago. It's the giant's fault that Eric Bischoff isn't president of WCW, and because of the giant, the NWO aren't where they need to be right now. Hogan says the group want to trim the fat, and there's only room for one giant in the New World Order. The NWO's already got big sexy. Jan says Kevin Nash will never be as big as he is. It doesn't matter if it's NWO or WCW, there's only one giant in the company and it's not Kevin Nash. So Hogan sets up a match, Nash vs Jan next week on Nitro. Whoever wins can stay in the NWO. Both men agree to fight in the middle of the ring on Monday night, so we'll be seeing that match on Reliving the War. To make it clear, there's still a wolf pack right now and there's still a black and white, though the two groups seem to kinda be on friendly terms, but not really. The term NWO Elite is not used here and neither is NWO B Team. As it stands right now, it appears that Hollywood Hogan's leading both groups. We check in on Raven again back at his home in Florida. Mommy Raven and Grandma Raven are trying to talk sense into Scott but Raven's not listening. Apparently he needs to go back to hospital and see his doctor to finish his treatment but Raven doesn't want to go. Chastity then makes an appearance, an old member of Raven's Nest in ECW, however here in WCW she's playing the role of Raven's sister. Kenyon has the hots for Raven's sister, Chastity doesn't seem too interested in Kenyon, but Grandma Raven seems to be very much into young Christopher. This is a bit awkward isn't it? Raven ends up walking away while his mom and his sister argue, we'll come back to the Raven household a bit later on. Back in the arena, Bam Bam Bigelow took on Jerry Flynn, a 30 second match that saw Flynn hit a wheel kick in the corner and Bam Bam replying with greetings from Asbury Park. I'm not sure how Bam Bam got his contract in storyline but it looks like he's now part of the WCW roster and he's out here squashing guys like Jerry Flynn. To be honest, I'm not complaining. Barry Windham and Kurt Hennig come out for an interview and Barry can't believe David Flair's teaming up with his dad had sold out. There's no way that little pipsqueak can survive inside a wrestling ring with two second generation superstars. Kurt Hennig says he's the man who closed the door on the four horsemen and at this point Ric Flair should just find a building and Ric Flair should just jump off. Jesus, okay then. Flair has lost his mind, he's sacrificing his kid on a WCW pay per view. Kurt thinks he needs to bring Grandma Hennig in to whip this kid's ass, but Kurt and Barry accept the pay per view match because it's gonna be a night off anyway. Take note though, while Kurt did appear with the NWO earlier, he is not wearing his NWO shirt. It also appears that this thing he's got going on with Barry Windham's gonna be a permanent thing, so maybe Hennig's another piece of the NWO that Hogan and company want to push out. After a commercial break, Mean Gene bumps into Juventud Guerrera in Juventud's trying to escape the arena. He says they got Eddie, the Wolfpack are taking out LWO members, and Hoovy's making sure he isn't the next one who gets jumped for wearing an LWO shirt. It's very possible that the LWO are going to disband now, but we'll see how this unfolds during Thunder and next week's episode of Nitro. Back in the ring, we've got Disco Inferno vs Chavo Guerrero, and Disco's also removed his NWO red and black shirt. Granted, he didn't beat Bigelow two weeks ago and he failed to gain entry into the group, but this is another angle that we'll see develop a bit more over the next few weeks. Pepe's got a neck brace on after Norman Smiley wiggled all over the stallion, and when it's Disco Inferno saying that this is stupid then you know something isn't right. Norman's definitely being an influence on young Chavo though. Chavo even dances a little during this match so the Disco Inferno better watch out. Guerrero Jr. floors Disco with a dropkick afterwards and after taking a clothesline, Disco decides to take a timeout. Seeing as Pepe is injured, Chavo lets his pet horse ride him around the ring, how considerate. Disco gets back in and he puts Chavo down with a swinging neckbreaker and look, Disco's about to use Pepe as a weapon but he decides against it. We're definitely living in strange times if Disco's being reasonable. Chavo goes on offense after Nia and Disco ride in the Disco balls. Chavo lays in a few European uppercuts in the corner. It was going pretty well for Chavito right here, but look who it is. It's Norman Smiley, and he wants to do the big wiggle on Pepe once again. Norman does what he does best, and Chavo isn't too happy. So Mr. Smiley gets wiped out, and Disco takes advantage. The chartbuster ends the match, and Disco gets a pinfall win on WCW Thunder. I'm just happy the Chavo and Norman feud's going to continue on, and I sincerely hope that WCW keeps this going for a very long time.
According to Tony Schiavone, Eric Bischoff hates tag team wrestling. Tag wrestling was one of the traditions Ric Flair wanted to bring back to WCW, so a tag team tournament has been set up to crown new champions. Rick Steiner and Kenny Chaos or Judy Bagwell or whoever, they're no longer tag team champions. Rick's out with an injury, so the belts are up for grabs and we have a first round match here on Thunder, Super Colo and Liz Mark Jr vs Fit Finlay and Dave Taylor. The match wasn't good, Super Colo had a botchy moment right here here while Finley and Taylor struggled to get any heat. The crowd were silent, the commentators talked about the finger poke of doom, it felt like a filler match. Taylor won for his team following a butterfly suplex, but fear not fans of tradition, the NWO come out after the bell and they don't look too amused about this tag match. As a matter of fact, no one in the building looked amused at this tag team match. Both teams get attacked with Scott tasing everyone, Hall then grabs a microphone and he says the Wolfpack were watching the show in the back and they heard Shivani talking about this tournament and how Ric Flair wanted to bring back the good old days of WCW. The truth is, Big Sexy and Super Sexy were undefeated as the outsiders and that's why there's no tag wrestling anymore on TBS. This tag team tournament is not going to happen while the NWO's around, so there you go, no more tag wrestling on Thunder or Nitro guys. In the end, the tournament still takes place and the finals are held at Super Brawl in February. This was nothing more than the NWO coming out and pushing their weight around. Next up we've got Booker T vs Leparka and that mad bastard Leparka decided to come out while wearing an LWO shirt. This is not going to end well, I'm sure. The Wolfpack decided not to attack Leparka during the match, though they wait until he gets backstage. So you can sit back and watch this one knowing there's going to be a clear winner and that clear winner will probably be Booker T. Booker admires Leparka's dance moves before almost taking his head off with a running forearm. Leparka then gets tossed out of the ring and when he refuses to come back inside, Booker goes after him. This allows Leparka to get back inside the ropes and take advantage with a few hard chops to the chest and look at Booker's face. I think Leparka is going to pay for this dearly. Booker bides his time and he waits for the perfect opportunity to once again try to take his opponent's head off, but Booker quickly realizes that Leparka is no slouch after getting rocked with an enziguri. Leparka lays in a few mounted punches but Booker comes back with a few of his biggest moves, the spinning heel kick, the axe kick and the spine buster. Leparka takes all three moves but he still manages to send Booker out of the ring with a clothesline and the match goes to the outside. Booker loses his advantage here and Leparka decides to grab his trusty steel chair. In the end though, Booker is able to stop himself getting thrown into the corner and he performs a hardened sidekick. The kick hits the chair, the chair hits Leparka in the face and Booker wins via pinfall. This match was pretty decent for a thunder match as was Kidman vs Psychosis earlier on. WCW have a bunch of reliable guys on their roster mixed in with a bunch of lazy bastards it seems. We go back to the Raven household and check it out, Raven has his own swimming pool. A visitor comes along to say hello and it's the Sandman, straight from ECW and into WCW's payroll. Raven's mom's very happy to see James while Kenyon looks a bit dubious. I think Kenyon knows about this guy's past. The two say hello, Jimmy Boy doesn't like Kenyon's tone, so Chris gets slapped on the back and he takes a spectacular bump into the swimming pool. Sandman's quite the charmer, Chastity isn't too happy to see him but mommy and grandma Raven absolutely love sunshine Sandman. Raven then walks in the frame and he says his mom's doing it again, she's taking up her friend's free time. So Raven walks off in a huff and James says don't worry we've been through this before, James will go and talk to Raven and everything's gonna be okay. The question is, how does someone like the Sandman fit into WCW? Next up we've got Chris Jericho vs Conan, another Starcade rematch on the Superstation. And during Chris's entrance we see that the NWO jumped the parka. The shirt's been taken off his back, it's been spray painted, so again we get the impression that the Latino World Order is pretty much over in WCW. Conan comes to the ring to the sound of the Wolfpack's theme song and he's wearing a red and black shirt. It's a Conan red and black shirt however, and keep in mind that Conan hasn't been seen with the NWO all night. Jericho attacks during K-Dog's opening promo and the fight spills to the outside. Chris remains vicious inside the ropes with a few knee strikes and when K-Dog tries to build momentum he gets put right back down with a spinning wheel kick from the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller. Jericho chokes Conan in the corner before K-Dog finally has enough. Conan dodges a corner attack and Chris takes a hip toss before getting sent to the outside following a clothesline. It's at this point where the commentators realize something, Scott Dickinson's refereeing this Chris Jericho match, so Conan's probably at a disadvantage now without even knowing it. 
The two get in the ring and Conan applies a granted wrist lock. Ralphus is having a lot of fun on the outside as the two competitors get back to their feet. Conan gets launched into the top rope and Conan then falls victim to a suplex in the middle of the ring. K-Dog comes back with a bulldog, not quite a float over bulldog but close. Chris then takes the rolling lariat and Jericho gets slammed hard with a big Alabama slam. Chris throws Conan into Dickinson, he pulls something out of his kick pad and by god it's those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway. Conan gets whacked, Chris wakes the referee up, Scott begins to count but Saturn shows up and he pulls Scott out of the ring. K-Dog hits the Axe Factor face buster and Saturn counts to three. For some reason the timekeeper rings the bell and Conan wins via pinfall. After the match, Saturn raises Conan's hand in victory and I'm convinced that Conan isn't part of the NWO anymore. WCW guys don't help NWO guys usually, but this is a loose end that will get tied up very soon. The Thunder main event this week features Chris Benoit of the Four Horsemen taking on Barry Windham, a match that would have been something special when Barry was in his prime. I think most will admit that Wyndham wasn't main event material in 1998 but at the same time Chris Benoit hasn't been on TV much in these past few months and he too doesn't really fit the bill as a WCW headliner right now from a storyline perspective but at least it's something different. It started off pretty scrappy with both men trying to one up each other but it's Chris who goes in control with a ton of hard chops followed by a back elbow. On the outside, Wyndham continues to get wrecked when Chris throws his opponent into the steel steps and the two then trade chops, Big Barry's given as good as he gets here. A back body drop puts Chris back in control, Wyndham takes a few knees right to the face and Chris is determined to rip Wyndham's chest open with more knife edge chops. A low blow puts Benoit in his place though and Wyndham hits a DDT that silences the crowd for a moment and this gets followed up with a suplex. Chris then looks for a snap suplex and yeah that didn't look good at all did it? To be fair I don't think Wyndham was ready to take the move so quickly but the two get up again only for Wyndham to get knocked down again with a clothesline. Chris hits the referee by accident and the official goes down, Barry takes a German suplex and Kurt Hennig thinks this is the perfect opportunity to get involved in the match. Benoit applies the crossface on Kurt immediately but he ends up taking a boot to the head from Wyndham and surprisingly this is enough to put Chris away. Barry Wyndham defeats Chris Benoit via pinfall in the Thunder main event. Big Steve McMichael hits the ring afterwards and he cleans house. The show ends with McMichael throwing Kurt Hennig out of the ring and the heels leave with their tails between their legs. And yeah, not the most exciting main event in WCW history, right? It was pretty hard hitting and the chops were stiff as hell but not what I'd call a good main event at all. And that was WCW Thunder after the finger poke of doom. You can see now why I wanted to cover this separately and you can hopefully see why covering the talking points of this show in next weeks reliving the war episode would have been a disaster. I'll be telling folks next week to check this video out if they want to know everything that went down in between the finger poke of doom and next weeks episode of nitro so by watching this you've saved yourself a lot of time and I've also saved myself a lot of time going back and forth. The tone of this United NWO is now being set. There's still some tension within the group and yes I agree it's a pretty old idea at this point but understanding how this new version of the red and black got started definitely gives you a head start as a viewer. So thanks for watching guys, hopefully you enjoyed this special episode of Reliving the War, I'll see you all next week for more as always and please take care. To bring your residence, the whole scene is decadence And the feeling is true I'm seeing feet in my crew, you see it black and blue uh, yeah. So let's go for the ride Strap yourself in tight and if you're bone to find this uh, Breathe and stop, for real And give it what you got Just uh, breathe and stop, for real And give it what you got Give it what you got And you're making a hot, give it on the block Give it what you got, give it what you got